life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. 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 <laughs> we are talking about uh, Season 2, Episode 13 today. Last episode of Season 2. It is called Beside the Dying Fire. This episode, it's crazy. It's chaotic. There is a lot happening. It's very action-packed. Yes. Stay with us. We're going fast. It sounds calm. Beside the Dying Fire sounds like they're playing guitars and just like... Yeah. Yeah. yeah it sounds like you really want to break out... It sounds like you really want to just break out some s'mores and just go for that. Speaking of s'mores, yeah, this is kind of off the subject, but we found these chocolate marshmallows with chocolate on the inside at Target. Mm. Um, easiest way to make s'mores ever. Yeah, like 10 seconds in the microwave. It's great. Anyway, let's get into our episode. This episode aired on AMC on March 18th, 2012. Upon airing, the episode attained 9 million viewers, became the highest rated cable telecast of all time <laughs> demographically. This accolade was previously held by the second season episode, Nebraska. I just want to stop that for a minute and let's really have this sink in. 9 million viewers, mm -hmm. highest of all time. That is crazy. <laughs> But I think after what happened in the last episode, Shane's death, people were like, what is going to happen? Let us all watch. <laughs> it's also crazy be considering that that is a good rating. Because, like, if you look back at, like, when I grew up, I was just watching, like, half of the people in America watched the end ep last episode of MASH. Mm -hmm. That is nowhere near that. Yeah, it is. So it's just to really change the, the thing. But, but it also is, like, a validation of, like, the good stories that that the nerds have experienced for so long are finally coming to people are finally realizing how good they are. Right. Mm -hmm. That obviously this episode outperformed a lot of things, but it also outperformed all cable programming of the day as well as the week dated March 25th. Obtaining significantly higher ratings than Swamp People on History <laughs> Channel and Jersey Shore on MTV, That's which not fair. were the next highest of the week. That's just not fair. No. <laughs> Poor Swamp People. Um, like I said, this is a very action-filled episode, and we're going to start right now. The first in scenes before we hit the intro is a lot of scenes, one right after the other. Um... The first one is the Hurt Building, which is at 50 Hurt Plaza in Southeast Atlanta, Georgia, 30303. We talked about this building um, in a previous episode. We talked about how it is Starbucks in the lobby. In front of it, walkers are eating a, a dog. Yeah, they're or eating the yeah. remains of a dog. And they see a helicopter. And this is the second time that we see a helicopter pass over the same exact area in Atlanta. This was in the very first episode a helicopter passed over this area mm -hmm. and suggests that it follows a route. And it's possibly setting up supply drops for the CRM that we see in Fear the Walking Dead mm -hmm. and later in other series. Mm -hmm. But the noise of the helicopter draws the walkers away from the city. You can also see the Metro Grill that's across the street in one of the scenes. This was located on the campus of Georgia State University. Um, it's currently closed, but at the time they served sandwiches and grilled items and they had a salad bar. Hmm. So that's fun. Then you see a shot of walkers walking beside the road. Um, I have a couple websites that I hit up that tells you where these shots are filmed. Uh, this one was shot at 1001 Rock House Road, and this is in Sonoya, Georgia. And very close to here is, I saw that there was a Chapman farm. There's lots of cute horses. It's like this big horse resort. Next, you see a lot of walkers in a field, and they hit a fence. The sign says, trespass, it's your ass. I'm just going to say that, point out. Um, I know we don't swear a lot in this, in this, but, you know, hey, it is what it is. Um, the crowd of walkers seem to keep multiplying and the fence breaks. Okay, so I didn't, I read this online. Um, I didn't fully write it down, but I'm going to mention it. There's a, apparently one of the walkers in this. She's wearing a cardigan and it gets stuck on 
the uh, barbed wire of the fence mm -hmm. and kind of gets snagged and she basically takes it off and keeps going. Not one of those like it gets caught and falls off. She literally takes it off. I barely saw it. It was very blink and you miss it, but I did read about it online. Uh, so if you guys do see that, send us an email. Yeah, Tell they, me if you saw she it. She probably did it in the heat of the moment and they trimmed it in the editing. Right, when they're trying to break through the fence and she just like needs to keep going. Mm -hmm. The walkers are now in the forest and they hear the gunshots, which remember, one from Shane, one from Carl, and that starts to lead them to Herschel's farm. And then they give you this shot of the walkers and then kind of leading into the farm where you can see Rick and Carl on the other side of the barbed wire starting to walk toward the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get the intro. So now, the only thing I want to say about this where it's very uh, graphically beautiful and a really great idea. If you look at where Carl and Rick are in relationship to the fence... They are very close to the fence. They're not that far away. The walkers would be making a lot of noise. I believe they would be able to hear them at this point, but it takes them a while before they do. And that's where I call foul. Because I think that shot was basically for the cinematography and the beauty of it. And then the dramatic pause before you get to the intro. Is this mm -hmm. the first time we've seen the walkers lead into the people like the be the, the the kind of drawing thing into the action on any of the episodes because it seems to me like it is yes kind of i think so because i think the only other time we've really seen this is when they're all just hanging out in atlanta this is the first time that we've really seen a super herd just kind of materialize from a particular event and we do see super herds later on, but most of the time they already exist. But yeah, literally just lead us into the people that we know as opposed to starting on the people that we know. Mm -hmm. Right. So after the intro, we are at the farmhouse and everyone is gathered in the front room and Glenn and Daryl return. And remember, they have been tracking Randall or whatever happened to Randall and they know what happened. They know it's Shane. They know that Shane killed Randall. They had to kill Randall zombie. So they're coming back, and um, they seem to be the first ones to return. Yeah, and then Andrea's like, I'm going to go. Um, let's go take care of this. And Laura's like, no, Andrea, don't go. We need you in case Randall returns. So now Lori has accepted Andrea's place as a fighter. Um, they said they hear a gunshot. They're like, what's happened? What's going on? We heard a gunshots, which, of course, we're back to Shane and Carl. Mm-hmm. Daryl and Glenn explain how Randall is dead, but there are no bite marks. So Lori asks them to go back out and find Rick and Shane. At which point she realizes that Carl is not in the house. But how did she notice that Carl was in the house? Because if they're all downstairs, um, that's where the stairs are. You can legitimately see someone come down the stairs and walk out the front door. How did she miss this? Uh, she's not always the most observant person. Um, I think she's probably too busy worrying, and she just kind of assumed that he was still on the lookout position and with the with the uh, binoculars with the binoculars upstairs. Mm -hmm. She just kind of made the assumption while she was worrying. Right. In the field, Rick and Carl are kind of slowly walking back. They're talking about what happened with Shane. And my first note in my head was, how do they not hear those walkers? They're like right there, right? They look pretty close. And then all of a sudden, a split second after I thought that, they turn around and see the walkers. And then they start to run toward the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. Glenn, Daryl, and Andrea come out on the porch and see the horde that is coming at them. Rick and Carl are blocked from the house by part of the horde. And so they're going to try to veer off towards the barn, which if you remember is, I believe, to the left of the house. Yeah, the if map is not very the clear to me, so I right. can't tell you. If you're running towards the house, the barn is to the mm -hmm. left, the shack is to the right. Correct. If you case you're wondering. Uh, they barricade themselves in the barn, but the walkers are trying to break the door down. And at this point, Lori notices definitively Carl is not in the room. He mm -hmm. is gone. At the farmhouse, they're starting to distribute the guns. They're, they're also distributing ammo, 
And so you can actually see the boxes of ammo that they're using. It looks like they're nine millimeter ammo. Um, it's called Zelliger High Velocity. And I did some searching to see if I could find more information on it. And I can't actually find this brand. Mm -hmm. So I think they just kind of subbed in like a fake brand for it. Makes because, sense. you know, who wants to be the official ammunition of the zombie apocalypse? Wait, everybody. Wait, why is this not taken yet? I did have a thought that, like, there are all these people going to be shooting guns and stuff, but honestly, the noise makes no different. They're on their way anyway. They might as well use them. Mm -hmm. Herschel says it's his farm and he's going to die here. He has no thought in his mind whatsoever of leaving the farm. I just love Daryl's, like, good night as any <laughs> to die. <laughs> it's like, he's just always up for it. If it has to happen, it has to happen. And, uh, and Daryl's like, less talking, more walkers. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> and, yeah, like, they're totally right that there is no point. It's, there's no way that they're going to save the farm right now. Uh, at best, there are far more spooks than can be dealt with with just guns. You need, like, explosives. You need grenades and lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, uh, they actually mention, like, this many walkers would just level the, the house mm -hmm. just walking through it so the best they can hope to do is get all their supplies into the cars and get out of there right I think at this point we are in the barn and Rick is starting to realize that it doesn't really make a difference these walkers are as you are saying going to level things so he thinks he's going to start with the barn he starts to saturate the ground in gasoline because his intent is to burn it and kind of lead the walkers over to the barn so that they can either get away or something. I would like to make a point right now to remind you all that this barn did not exist on the land when they chose the spot to film. It was built specifically for this show and uh, what happens to it is not special effects and we will get there. The walkers are starting to break through the walls. Rick tells Carl to go up into the barn loft and then drop the lighter onto the gasoline hay on the ground. So here's a little bit about how they did this. This is actually kind of fun. So Carl sparks up the cigarette lighter and drops it into the horde of walkers. I think Rick is kind of like hanging onto the... Um, the rungs. The rungs of the ladder, right? So Greg Nicotero, the special effects director, used black panels to capture the elements of this fire. This enabled them to edit the flames onto the walkers. He reduced the chances of getting burned. The stuntmen put on several layers of flame retardant suits. The first layer consisted of a dry Nomex undergarment. This was followed by several layers of Nomex clothing that were gelled. Since the sequence was conducted on multiple occasions, the stuntmen were coated with gel containing cationic polymers. The last layer was a raincoat, which would separate the gel from the stuntmen's clothing and allowed them to be engulfed in flames for several seconds without injury. Now, what a lot of people might not know is what Nomex actually is. This is a fabric that, as it heats up, the fibers expand to the point where there is no gaps between the fibers. So if you take a Nomex fabric and you light it on fire, the fire will not go to the other side. The actual chemical reactions of the fire and the sparks won't go to the other side of the fabric. The heat will, mm -hmm. but while you're wearing a Nomex garment, you yourself will not catch on fire. Right. I believe the... the the Daytona guys, I think that, that you always see this white material that they're wearing mm -hmm. over their heads before they put their helmets on. Same stuff. So in this case, when he drops the lighter, the lighter itself is not lit. Um, it does drop, and that is because they had to film this part where they were on fire quite a few times. Um, this is not where they are going to light up the barn. Mm -hmm. So they had to do this part first before they did anything else, and they didn't want the fire to be out of control yet. They only wanted it to be controlled on the zombies' bodies. Let's go to the farmyard. This is where the action is really going to kick it up. We have a motorcycle, Maggie's car, the truck, and the RV. Uh, remember, they're all right next to the house because in the last episode, they decided to park them all right there. So it was very easy for them to all get in these vehicles. 
Daryl is on his motorcycle and he's shooting some walkers. So they all start to, to drive toward the barn, taking out walkers as they go. So remember, like we said, the barn was built specifically for this episode. So uh, they really did light it on fire and it did burn down. So this means that they had to shoot all of these parts all at once in real time before the barn collapses. Okay, that is to me a stressful situation right yeah. there because you have to have like, there's like five different vehicles and like six or seven different st- things going on at the same time. They had to have had multiple camera units. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking th- they, they don't show any of the camera units. Like there's no like, oopsie, see the dude with the camera off in the distance. No, this was like a choreographed scene of, the, of like epic proportions for a tv show this is crazy i mean when i grew up in the 80s we had like a lot of action tv shows chips and a team and all that kind of stuff that stuff what happened more on tv but at this point that's crazy and for it to happen on a small cable channel yeah. I mean, they really not that big a cable channel at this point it's a crazy production thing and i'm just thinking they're going to the table read for this and somebody goes so how are we going to shoot this All at once. What? (laughs) Well, here's the other thing, is that it's 27 degrees the night they were shooting this, which in Georgia, to me, is kind of crazy. Um, But the zombie's breath was visible. And since dead people don't breathe, the editors had to remove each zombie's breath with CGI. I'm also thinking that maybe the 27 degrees made the actual fire of the barn prolong itself because it's not hot outside, right? So the cold is going to maybe make it slower moving a little bit. Possibly. I don't know. Not, not a significant amount, I right. don't think. So other people in the different cars, Andrea is in the truck with T-Dog. Uh, it took me forever to see who was in the truck because <laughs> the way the cars were all over the place, I just saw people shooting out the windows. I couldn't tell who mm-hmm. was in what. Glenn is in Maggie's car, and uh, she is also shooting. Glenn is driving. Basically, it's just a zombie drive-by. It's mm-hmm. like mm. uh, We'll find out about the RV in just a little bit. At the house, Patricia, Beth, Carol, and Lori are there, and Cor- Lori... Cory. It's the new Lori Carl mix-up, Cory. Cory. Um... <laughs> Lori is screaming about how Carl's not there. She's starting to lose her head a little bit. Like, she needs to calm down. Take a breath. It's going to be okay. Look out. Maybe you will see him running across the farm. Okay, she anyway. Look, <laughs> look no at the barn, Lori. <laughs> no self-control. In the yard, so Jimmy is the one who is driving the RV, and he stops to shoot. And then the walkers bust through another fence. So Jimmy drives off toward the barn so he can pick up Rick and Carl, who get on the top. Because remember, they're up in the barn loft after setting Mm -hmm. the barn on fire. Uh, They get up on top of the RV. I think their thought is that they're going to just climb into the RV. But that's not what happens. Because the zombies open the RV door. What? Smart zombies. What? No. No. <laughs> I'm so sick of the smart zombie thing. What kind? Jimmy's what like, kind of like knob is it? It's a, is it like it's a, one of those ones that you have to put your hand into and like kick out towards yeah. you. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's not like just, the you know once they have the, the indoor door the doorknob. I would not buy that they could do that if it was a kind of more rectangular handle that could be pushed down. They they're they're kind of like constantly like in scraping mode as they walk, so they could technically. It's not a down. It's a sideways. Yeah, it, oh. it's like a car door, and it takes strength to open it. Yeah, I don't. Bl- I call foul. Do you guys want t-shirts? Yeah. I call foul. Hashtag call foul. Yeah, and but that's the bird. only answer is that there is smart zombies. If they just happen to be the ones right next to the RV. Yes. So poor Jimmy. Gets his leg bit and his neck. R.I.P. Jimmy. We barely knew ya. <laughs> Rick and Carl, uh, I don't know if they see what happens or what. I don't think they do totally. But they decide they're going to now climb down the back of the RV. And um, at that point, Rick can see all the blood splatters like on the inside of the window. So he's like, yeah, we're not going that we're over here. <laughs> <laughs> so Glenn is uh, in the car and he's shooting. 
But, like, rather than shooting, like, out the window, he's, like, going around over the top of it, sh- and he's using the roof to actually steady the aim, because he's using a rifle. Mm-hmm. So, rather than just being, like, from the hip, almost, while the car is bouncing all over the place, he's securing it over it, so he has a, he actually has stability in mm-hmm. the shot. Now, remember, Andrea's in the truck with T-Dog, and she's just shooting, 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 shooting. And she notices that they're going to run out of ammo, ammo soon, obviously. Yeah, and this is when we they really start to prove, not just realize, that inefficient guns are in a zombie fight. They just really aren't. And actually, stable. Mythbusters did a whole episode where they proved this. In this, they had had a foam-weighted axe and then a paintball gun and two different people using them. And they had a whole bunch of actor zombies attacking them. And in two separate sets of tests, the axe won. They, you survived longer and had a better kill count. Rick and Carl decide they're going to head off to the woods by themselves. Herschel is in front of the house shooting with a shotgun. Okay, so here's something else that's a little buggy. Uh, When firing on the walkers, Herschel fires a shotgun over a dozen times without stopping to reload. And I confirm this. I actually sat there counting. He shoots 18 shots, then he stops to reload and shoots 16 shots. And shotguns generally only hold between seven and nine shells when it's fully loaded. Also confirmed, his gun looks to be the Harrington and Richardson Partner Pump Compact, which holds five to six shots. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like it was a cutaway shot. No, it was continuously 18 shots. Mm -hmm. One camera shot. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Continuity. Lori and Carol come out of the house because they're looking to see where Carl went. And Carol says that Lori has to just trust that Carl's okay. Especially after she just lost her daughter and had to just trust that everybody would find her. She learned her lesson. So Lori, Patricia, Carol, and Beth start to run off. Looks like towards a vehicle or something. And Patricia, who is the last one, like behind Beth, gets caught and bitten while Beth is still hanging on to her. And Beth will not let go. So Lori grabs Beth to get her to let go of Patricia and just let her go. Because otherwise, Beth is going to get bit too. Uh, it's, it's just kind of crazy because Patricia and Jimmy were almost like cast as extras that they knew that they could just use as cannon fodder later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Expendable. Carol starts running over by the shack. As we remember, if you're looking at the farmhouse, the shack is on the right-hand side. So they had veered off from the farmhouse to the left. When you come out of the farmhouse, it would be to your left. Um, And she gets caught over there. So Andrea and T-Dog ride up. And Andrea gets out to get Beth and Lori inside the truck with T-Dog. And then she goes to help Carol, who's stuck over by the shack. So then Andrea gets taken surprise by a walker. So now Carol and Andrea are stuck outside and T-Dog basically leaves and he leaves Carol and Andrea behind. This is the final time that Lori and T-Dog will see Andrea, period. Yeah. Because Andrea has her own storyline where she goes off. And then by the time she comes back to the group, Lori and T-Dog are no longer alive. Correct. So that was interesting. When I saw that note, I was like, oh, that's true. (laughs) Andrea shoves off the walker, but I don't really know what happened to Carol. She's like lost in the chaos. I didn't really see what happened to her. My my best guess is that she just ran off and Mm -hmm. we later see her with another group. Like she got picked up. Right. Yeah. Then Glenn and Maggie in Maggie's car get surrounded and Glenn tells Maggie, just get off the farm. Which she does, even though she kind of does it while she's in shock about what, everything that's happening. Mm-hmm. Herschel is still shooting the shotgun. And as he's reloading, a walker approaches him from behind. And suddenly, Rick shows up and shoots the walker just behind Herschel's head. Now, I call foul. Firing a gun from that close to someone's ear should make him or her unable of hearing anything for at least a few minutes. But immediately after Rick shoots next to his head, Herschel hears and answers Rick's question easily. There was no sign language involved, nothing like that. Uh, we're, we're just talking rule of cool here, so of course you can hear it. 
Rick gets Herschel to follow him and Carl to the red truck, which is also parked by the farmhouse. Andrea is signaling the red truck, but they drive off. Because we assume they just didn't see her because she's signaling them from behind them as they're driving driving right. off. But we will talk about that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Daryl is watching the barn burn from a distance. He's on his motorcycle. So then he hears a scream, and now we know where Carol is. So he goes and gets her onto the back of his motorcycle, and they drive off. When Rick, Herschel, and Carl drive away from the farm, Herschel is still watching the farm from the back window. So the internet thinks, and I kind of agree with them, that he should easily notice Andrea running toward the car when they were escaping the farm. I do agree with this, but I don't totally agree with this because it is dark. And she is surrounded by walkers when that happens. Right. Like there's walkers kind of going all over the place there. Right. There's just a question of faculties as well. Mm -hmm. If you're in that heightened adrenaline mode, you're not picking up everything. I mean, right. you do sense certain things, but you're also in that fight or flight mode. you got to get out. And that's kind of where mm -hmm. you're at. So she has to go run over into the trees. We don't totally see that happen. We think maybe she's also gone. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. The barn is still burning. If you watch it when it starts to collapse, the walkers are surprised and they look back at it. There's a couple of them that look mm -hmm. back at like, what? And that's because it really surprised them because this is a real fire and that barn really burned down to the ground. Yeah. And they, they might not have necessarily thought, like, some of them might have been like, oh, yeah, this is all special effects. Cool. Oh, man, that thing burned down. Oh, I'm acting. Um, but actually, the te technically speaking, any loud noise or anything, the zombies would be turning around. Yes. Right, yeah. So yeah. it didn't break that. Um, we also see, because the RV was left right next to the barn, we actually watch as the RV burns down. Right. This I actually got... An a little confused because as we all know there is an RV that shows up later on in the series as well. I couldn't remember if that was Dale's RV or not. It is not and that basically mm -hmm. confirms it. And this is the last bit of Dale that the group could rely on. Mm -hmm. It was the steady companion that could get them through anything and they just lost it along with the only other source of security they could have the farm. There is nowhere that is safe anymore. No. So there's a commercial break right at this moment as the barn goes down. And here's where we stand. Daryl and Carol are on the motorcycle. Andrea is running in the woods, which we'll find, see her later. Herschel, Rick, and Carl are in the red truck. T-Dog, Lori, and Beth are in the blue truck. Maggie and Glenn are in her car. Right? Or it's yep. a car. I don't know if it's her car. It's not her car because her car was destroyed on the road. Yeah. The farm's car. Yeah. And they're all kind of like, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to go? Where is everybody else? We don't know. And this is just a, what? Kind of rhymed there. Oh, good. Good. I'm a poet. This is something that's really important for, like, when you are in a dangerous situation like this when you're in the apocalypse and you've got a group even if you have a home base that seems like it's safe like it's secure always have an external rally point set up like e even if you have like just some evil villains that come up or you have a super horde that's coming you need to know where everyone's supposed to go and all the different ways you can get there can you tell that marshall was trained on emergency protocol of a attraction we call it a muster station yes mm -hmm. um but this is just true in general i mean if you are living out of a a mall have a place another store somewhere else outside of the mall where everybody comes afterwards well in this point too there is an unofficial rally point and we will get there but it was never official and i don't think the people like herschel's family knows knew yeah. That that was probably what that was going to be. But it it does become apparent that there is a rally point, even though they don't talk about it. Yeah, they never actually discuss on screen, this is where we're going to come back to. But they, yeah, but they, aren't even, they, they don't even know. They kind of just, like, decide in their own groups that they should go to this place. Yeah. We'll get there. So we are now see in the forest, and there's Daryl. He's driving. He's maneuvering the bike past the walkers, weaving in and out. Very, very good. 
Maggie is in total shock about the farm and if her dad and Beth have made it. She's asking Glenn if he knows what happened. How does he know what happened? He's been in the car with you. Mm -hmm. Um, He wants to go to the highway where they lost Sophia. So this is the first person who says, hmm, maybe other people will go there. Maybe we should go there. Yeah. And she's like, well, all the herd came from over there, so, you know, it's not going to be safe. But... All the zombies are now at the farm, so it's probably somewhat clear at this point. Exactly. I mean, there may be some stragglers, but... Yeah. Yeah. She asks about Jimmy and Patricia. Again, Glenn doesn't know he was with you, but we know they didn't make it. And from this point, home, like Marshall was saying earlier, home is temporary. Home is where you sleep, but maybe not where you stay. It's just kind of like she has to realize that she's been had this safe place to be raised on and stay for so long. Uh, Maggie has, but it's not the truth anymore. Home is where the heart is, and your heart is in your chest, and your chest is moving on your legs. You better start running. They stop the car so Glenn can drive, because remember he was in the passenger seat shooting. Glenn finally tells Maggie that he loves her, which, I'm sorry, (laughs) let's just talk about for a moment how she said she loved him, like half a season ago and has that many things really been happening that you know when given the opportunity the only opportunity was when they've had this life-threatening earth-shaking thing happen to them and not when she was putting his items in her room Belaney Belaney it's like speed it's like the end of speed oh right Right. If you guys don't know, in Speed, it's like dangerous situations that when people experience them together, it causes them to, you know... Bond. Bond, yeah. Now we're on the highway, and we see that the red truck goes to the place where they lost Sophia. So that is Carl Herschel and Rick. Mm -hmm. You can see that all of the items are still there on the car, but the labels are kind of worn off a little. If you want to know what's on the car, go back and listen to one of our earlier episodes. I tell you everything that's on the hood of that car. And I'm pretty certain that some of that stuff has gone bad because we have been several weeks now since they left that thing. Correct. So Carl asks, where is Lori? Why are they running? Um, I mean, I feel like they came to a smart spot and people should be meeting there. Like, it's logical. It's, it's the one spot that they know of outside that they told Sophia to stay. So I think a lot of people would, would in their mind, say, oh, yeah, that would be a logical place to go. And in the this is also a spot where they have food set aside. Mm-hmm. So in the event that they had to make an emergency dash and they didn't have any time to put their supplies in, there's at least a little bit of food to start from. And right. also because everybody, every individual group has people from the original group in, mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. Um, they would, they would know. That's like how they if know it was it. only like so, so one group from the farm, they wouldn't know. But, mm-hmm. you know. So Herschel says he's going to wait on the highway so Rick can take Carl to safety. But Rick doesn't want to split up. And I think that's a very smart thing to say. Mm-hmm. He says that Herschel should have faith that people are going to come together. They're going to, they're going to find each other. Herschel says that Christ promises the resurrection of the dead, but he thought that meant something a little different. And actually, some readings of Revelations, depending on how you want to interpret things, because Revelations is very poetic in its language, it suggests the possibility of a zombie apocalypse, Mm. as these things that come out of the pit come and sting people, and they'll want to die, but they will not be able to die. Mm. Eh, It could be a zombie apocalypse. So Rick is adamant that they stick together. Do not split up. It's a lot harder to find people if you're not together. Bingo. Right? So then we're along the road. A different part of the, of the... It's not the highway. It's an actual road. There's a blue truck driving. This is the truck that has Lori, Beth, and T-Dog. Lori says that they need to go to the highway. And Beth is just in shock again. Which I will tell you why in a minute. Because it actually is in the deleted scene about why she's in shock. Mm-hmm. T-Dog says they have to go to the coast. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I remember why he wants to go to the coast, but he wants to go to the coast. Wasn't there military stuff that he was talking about? I I think he wanted to get to the coast and then see if they can get a boat and just go out in the ocean. Oh, right. Then Lori tries to jump out of the car while T-Dog's still driving, which makes T-Dog turn around and go to the highway. So there's a deleted slash extended scene. Um, It is still this scene, so it's not totally deleted, but 
there is an extended uh, conversation where Beth is upset about Patricia and then blames Lori for taking Beth from Patricia after Patricia has been bitten. And Lori's kind of like, no, if you had stayed, you would have been bitten. And then Beth just basically shuts down again. On the highway, there's a lone walker going by and Rick is hiding from him and lets him go past. Now here's something fun I found. When Rick, Carl, and Herschel are waiting for the walker to pass after escaping the farm, there is no rear window in their car. But after regrouping with the other survivors, there is a rear window. I confirmed this. The window comes back. <laughs> what? There must have been multiple red trucks. Carl says he's not leaving without Lori. And then all of a sudden you hear this coo 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 And you know it's Daryl and he's with Carol and they come on the motorcycle and then it just shows everyone showing up. So Maggie and Glenn are there and there's the blue truck and everyone's all back together and they look happy and Herschel's like really happy. Everybody's really happy. For some reason, Daryl makes this Asian driving joke to Glenn. I'm not happy with it, so we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, well, we're the only ones that made it so far. We don't know what happened to the other people. Lori asks about Shane because, of course, this is the first time that they can actually reveal what happened to Shane. Right now, only Rick and Carl know. Rick can kind of play it off like he got caught in the horde. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, it's kind of funny, too, because you see this... Like, this kind of shock but also relief on Lori's face that she doesn't have two men to contend with anymore. T-Dog says that he saw Andrea go down. They're not exactly sure but... He's also like when he's saying this he's also trying to keep the group from going back to the farm. Right. He doesn't want anybody to go back there because he knows it's dangerous but everybody would be like well, Andrea's still there. Let's go get her. Well, Daryl wants to go back, mm -hmm. but Beth, Beth says that they got Patricia, and then Rick tells everyone about how Jimmy was in the RV and he got killed. So then they start talking about where they want to go, uh, but they have to kill that lone walker first <laughs> before anything. So then they decide to just drive to find somewhere else that they're going to go, which I think is kind of a silly situation. I mean, Shane and Rick have been driving around that place trying to figure out a place for Randall to go. You would think that they would have some kind of idea of where they could go yeah. themselves. But whatever. They leave the blue truck behind and they take the red truck, Maggie's car, and Daryl's on the bike. And I assume everyone is in the red truck except Maggie, Glenn, and Daryl. Okay, so now we're in the forest because we're going to follow Andrea. So she made it and she's running through the woods with the walkers after her and she has a handgun and a bag of guns and a bunch of ammunition. So my question is, Marshall, is this a handgun or the Beretta? I see she has two handguns. So which one is she using? So um, she has been using the Beretta that she got later on, the bigger, heavier gun. Mm -hmm. um, and she does have the other one available to her. But when she's looking, she has to look through the bag and she realizes that the bag is empty of ammo now. She fills her, her pockets with bullets and she uses that to reload the Beretta. But at this point, we can say that her father's gun is now empty. Yeah. She has been using it the entire way on her escape and used up the last of the bullets. Mm -hmm. And she has enough to fill that Beretta, but now she's out of ammo. We no longer have to track that gun. You are correct. We are done. She continues to kill some walkers coming after her, and uh, we leave her to go back to the road. Rick is driving the car, and all of a sudden they run out of gas. Rick has an issue with this. He keeps driving these cars, running out of gas. They decide to set up a perimeter to stay together. And you can see that Carl is shivering in the cold. Even when, like, it's possible that the camera wasn't on him or that nobody was watching, he's still shivering. Just acting. hitting, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's actually doing some really good acting here. Glenn says that the walkers look to be migrating around. That's, I think that's possibly true. Rick says they have to find a stable place, and Maggie wants to know how long they can stay safe. Well, you don't know that, really. Daryl reveals that Shane killed Randall. So there's this, like, moment there where everyone's kind of like, okay, but they're not that shocked by it, I've noticed. Yeah. You know? 
Rick finally lets the shoe drop. And he tells them the thing that he has been holding on to for an entire season. They are all infected. The group is now very shocked. <laughs> I mean, shocked to the point that they are angry at Rick. They are now starting to mistrust Rick and starting to turn against him, which really isn't that big of an idea. Like, really that big of a deal? I don't think so. Like, if somebody was to tell me, hey, we're all infected. If any of us dies, we come back. I'd be like, that's helpful to know. Shoot the head on everybody. Yeah, Got but it. that's from a place of logic, not a place of that they just came out of right. trauma. Yeah. Of course they're going to look for somebody to blame because they're emotionally, like... So here's brain. a question. Mm-hmm. If Dale was still there, would he be the one person to be like, guys, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. A little note about this location that they are at where they're having the fire. Uh, There's like a little, uh, like a cliff area, it looks like. Um, And then there's like a little like walled off area where they're sitting around the campfire. This location has a tour that you can take. And um, where I found this, the last time the person wrote about it, he said it was $10 a person. Um, And there's a number you can call. It is located at 1843 Elders Mill Road in Sonoya. Um, And it's like, like I said, stone structures. There's a waterfall, etc. I think this is like remnants from the Civil War. And Mm -hmm. a a small dam that is holding back a lake. That's what we're looking at here. So then um, there's a scene where Rick is kind of with Lori by themselves and he tells her that he killed Shane. At this point, it occurred to me, I remembered, that Shane's gun is still buried in the leaves outside the farm. Not that that makes a big difference, but that's where it is. There's, yeah. there's a gun out there. Rick tells Lori that he figured out that Shane was trying to lure him out by himself to kill him. And Lori is trying to process this. But Rick reveals that he wanted him dead and he wanted this over with. So that's why it finally drew him to the edge. But also, Shane turned and confirmed Jenner's theory that everyone has this infection. Mm -hmm. Lori's okay with all of this up to this point. But when Rick says that Carl was the one who shot zombie Shane, Lori is furious. And I don't understand why. I mean, she kind of forced this whole thing to happen. She poked the bear. She caused Shane to have hope that this whole thing would be okay if Shane shot Rick. And then the whole thing with Carl, um, if you really cared that much, number one, why didn't you realize your son had just walked down the stairs from upstairs and left the house? To cause this to happen. Yeah, I will say that what Shane said when he said that Lori was broken, I don't necessarily buy the term broken, but she's not a strong person. No. She doesn't have a strong character, moral character. She just kind of goes with the wind. Whoever has the strongest argument, she'll go with that. But then when it comes to her kid, she goes, well, I guess I'm supposed to be the mother here. It's obligation. There's no real feeling. There's no real strength to it at all. She is... It's like she reacts. She doesn't act. Mm. Mm. That's true. We go back to the forest where we see that Andrea is still fighting zombies. And she must be really tired at this point. And she's resorting to using her gun as a bludgeon before she pulls out her knife. Because she's out of ammo. (laughs) Hashtag pistol whipping the dead. Mm. She stumbles onto the ground and a zombie goes to grab her. And then we see that the zombie loses its head and everyone collective cheers because it's Michonne. And I remember when we first watched this episode, uh, I remember that people were going crazy when Michonne shows up and I'm like, I don't read the comics. I don't know what's going on. But now that I've gone all the way through the series, yes, I am here for it, Michonne. So though this episode marks the first appearance of Michonne, Actress Denai Guerrera does not portray her in this episode. Michonne had not been cast yet, which is why we never see her face. Her face is covered by a shadow from her hoodie. Her casting was announced on Talking Dead in 2011, which aired right after this particular episode's finale. It would be good to give the stunt person their their, their credit here. 
we go back to the group, which I am calling the Waterfall Camp right now. So there's a lot of feelings. <laughs> a lot of feelings happen right now. There's loss of the farm, loss of trust. Carol says she can't trust Rick. She wants a man of honor. Carol, really? Maggie says they should take their chances and go somewhere else. Herschel says they need to stay. They keep hearing branches snapping all around them. Everyone wants to leave. Rick says no. And then he's like, I've had it. I'm going to tell you what happened to Shane. So he tells everybody that he has killed Shane. Again, Rick, not the best idea here. They already don't like you right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe telling him, telling them that you killed someone who was alive when you already said you don't kill the living is not really giving them the best opportunity to trust you again. And then Carl is like breaking down. He's just crying because he had to relive it all over again. In this moment, I feel like Rick is acting a little bit like Shane. Mm -hmm. And like he's trying to convince himself that what he did was right and everything is going on. But he's also, he's trying to grieve Shane. And I think a little bit of Shane is coming out because he's reliving his friend. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's not a democracy anymore. I mean, uh, what the heck? What the heck, Rick? It's now a dictatorship? Dictatorship. Like, yeah, uh, this is the birth of the Rictator, which we got to cre credit, you know, trademark to the Talking Dead. That they're the ones that came up with that term. But yeah, it's definitely the birth of the Rictator. So then Rick is like, I'm done. And he walks off. But as you see him walking off, the camera pans up and over and you can see season three, the prison. And you can add this in, uh, Marshall. It's Demita Jane Howard is the stunt double for Michonne. Gotcha. Let's talk about what died in this episode. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we have Jimmy. We have Patricia. We have Herschel's farm. And one more, the RV. Yep. RIP that RV. Also, Andrea's gun. Andrea's father's gun, which mm -hmm. is now, we assume, to be empty mm. and useless. I would like to talk about the title because we did talk earlier about how Beside the Dying Fire seems to be like this really calm thing in a very chaotic episode. But uh, the original use of Beside the Dying Fire is from a lullaby. It's called Garden Mother's Lullaby. It's by Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Woo. Joey Camps. Uh, <laughs> I want to see if I can read this because there is a couple words in here that are unusual. It says, Aline Bon O, my child, my joy, my love and heart's desire. The crickets sing you lullaby beside the dying fire. And I feel like this is referring to the dying embers of Rick's hope. This is a part where he is so despairing. And it, it's the these the fire in him to keep going is about to burn out. Mm. It's also basically just the final nail on the coffin of what was before. Mm -hmm. For everybody has come to realize that what was before, what their lives, the civilization, everything they knew that existed and leaned on and relied on mm -hmm. is gone. Yeah. In the comic book, I just kind of want to wrap up. Uh, the first two chapters are kind of up to date. In chapter three of the comic, it starts to go into the prison part. Uh, so the last little holdings I have is that in the comic, before they leave for Herschel's farm, or they leave, the group leaves Herschel's farm, Glenn decides he's going to stay behind with Maggie instead of go with the group. So that's not totally what happens here because at that point, um, I think in the comic, the farm exists and the prison exists together. But in this case, that's not what happens. And then at the end of chapter two, they find the prison. So I am now caught up on the comic. I have to read further for the next season. Um, let's do just a really quick wrap up of what you feel like for the season. How you feel this season went. Well, let's face it. This is the season where people abandon the show. Um, just to be all truthful, everybody that I talked to said 
there's not much going on. They're just on a farm. Why is there any action? Why isn't I just and they bailed on it? They just bailed on it. And <clears throat> what struck me I, about this last episode is it it was great. I thought it was a great episode. Mm -hmm. um, I actually thought both of the episodes. You really kind of they really have twelve and thirteen. They're like a they really have a yeah. whole yeah. And I thought they 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 were they really handled that tension that ac the action very well in both of them um mm -hmm. despite the continuity errors mm -hmm. and some of the things right. but yeah I, I i definitely think they really pull it around and i think that what really hadn't happened maybe up till this point uh is i think they were reading the social media because mm -hmm. from this point on they never let it lull too right. long they never let they always have to have the intense action then a little bit of like like a little bit of lull right so, get, so you can get your bearings but they never let it go that long anymore but this well, is the longest thing i think it. that two of the issues with this season as you're saying this and i kind of agree is that number one if you read the comics things happen very rapidly um, in the comics, just boom, 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 which kind of keeps your interest a little more. This is more of a slow burn, a characterization, and its only villain, really, is no longer the zombie. It's Shane and the mystery of the barn. And in that case, it's not that terrifying, really. Not until you get into season three, where you get the governor. Do you really start ramping up these villains that are truly sick, disgusting, terrifying people that make your skin crawl because it's a human and not a zombie who is the villain? Right. And that's what you really see. Like in Season one, the enemy was the zombies. Mm -hmm. Season three and going forward, there's always an external threat. There may be some drama inside the group, but there's an external threat. Mm -hmm. Season two, the threat was entirely internal. It was entirely human drama. It was baby mama drama, basically. Mm -hmm. That was driving this plot. And that's not as interesting as an external threat. So I think that's why a lot of people left it. As far as how I feel about this season, yeah, it did kind of dip. But there was some scenes in here where they really had good character moments. And very quiet, but profound moments. And I feel like if they were to take out a lot of these scenes of spinning spinning your wheels on certain topics over and over and over again, if they tightened that up, this would be a lot faster moving of a season without losing the quiet moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times would we sit there and say, uh, we're talking about this again, you know, yeah, they could have cut a lot of those things out. And also, by and large, a lot of these deleted scenes that I've been seeing, to me, would have been super interesting to stay in mm -hmm. that did not. So maybe they could have done a swap and it would have been that much more interesting. Another thing, just to say, I think it would be curious to see if Andrea Yang, who now runs um, Walking Dead... If she had been running those, and maybe the female characters... Angela Kang? Angela Kang, I'm sorry, yes, Angela uh -huh. Kang. If Angela Kang had been running this, if those female... It, the, the issues we have are two, basically two females are Andrea and and Lori. They're, the way they're handled, maybe they would have been handled differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would have been a deeper, deeper yeah. part of it. But, yeah, I mean... Really, because Maggie hasn't had a chance to emerge yet as being more central. And I think with what happens to Lori in the next season, that gives Carol and Maggie a chance to really step into those leadership roles yeah. in that group a lot more. I would say that Maggie, that with the actress, does such a good job of g getting you behind her. Like, she's, she's, she's doing the work in this mm -hmm. season. Later on, I think the writing improves on her. Right, for sure. Well, that is the end of season two, y'all. Next week, we are going to start season three. That's episode one. I don't know what the name is, but we will get there. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. 
If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.